Good evening and welcome to the, oops, that's the, wrong item. the Harupa Unified School District Board of Education Common Core Special Meeting. We'll start with roll call, please. President Schmidt? Here. Trustee Mendez? Here. Trustee Schaefer? Here. Trustee Johnston? Here. Trustee Hernandez? Here. And Mr. Mendez, would you do the flag salute for us, please? Be happy to. Thank you. Please join me in the allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. <clears throat> Thank you. And tonight we're going to have a general discussion on the local control funding formula, LCFF, and the local control accountability plan, the LCAP. Mr. Duchamp. Well, good evening. Um, oh, public comment. Oh, sorry, I didn't see that. Do I have any public comments tonight regarding these two items? Seeing none, we'll move on. Well, good evening, <laughs> again, good evening. or good afternoon. <laughs> and this is um, an interesting time for public education. And what, what we've done in terms of structures, we've prepared a um, PowerPoint, and then, which we hope will be um, engender some discussion on your part. So if you have questions as we go, um, please feel free to interrupt if you want to hear, you know, if you want to wait for the whole thing to be done and have questions or comments. Um, that's fine also. So basically, we have a new, well, we have two, so you can get up the first one for me right now. We have a new program in California called the Local Control Funding Formula. And the governor and legislature designed this because they ran out of letters of the alphabet for everything else that we had. So you can now replace MYPs, BRLs, um, and anything else, categorical funds, TIG and SIG and everything else with the LCFF, unless it's federal and you can't replace anything federal with anything from the state. So let me talk a little bit about the local control funding formula. It was based on two very strong principles. One is that different students require different resources. So the legislature picked three general categories of students. Those students who come from poverty, those students who do not speak English as a first language, and foster youth. And they gave different weights to each of these students. So this is not a new concept. Actually, it goes back probably as far back as the 1970s. Um, a gentleman by the name of Michael Kirst, who just now happens to be president of the State Board of Education, um, has been writing and researching this issue for years. And a number of other states do what's called a weighted student formula, which essentially this isn't. And um, Paula will get into the weight specifically a little, in a little, few minutes. But the idea is that so, if you have a student that requires, that's an English language learner, they're going to require resources that someone who speaks English fluently would not need. Um, the other form, the other fundamental foundation of it is that decisions about students are best made at the local level. And for California, actually for the country, this is pretty new because we have gone from more and more local control back to state control. And so now in California, basically all except for a handful of categorical programs are gone. There were, no, I can't remember the number, between 60 and 80 categorical programs in California. And we used to come and they'd have names like CBET or um, a couple of them still exist, but TIG or transportation. And essentially what happened over the years is the legislature, a lot of times when there was either extra money or a particular local issue or sometimes a statewide issue, or a problem they thought they needed to solve, they'd throw money at it and call it a program. And it became a categorical. Well, the categoricals over the years became 
kind of in some ways confused, in some ways misdirected, and very, very complex with different kinds of requirements throughout the years. And they didn't necessarily address the needs of all students, and oftentimes the money could only be spent on specific students. So the concept now, under the local control funding formula, is the district will get different amounts of money for each student, also at different grade spans. There's four different grade spans that get different amounts of money, and then each student, an English language learner, a low-income student is defined by federal poverty guidelines and for our, our uses. Are you going to go into this? The, it's free and reduced lunch children, primarily. And um, also foster youth, of which we have 136 in the district. And uh, interestingly, foster youth generally qualify for free and reduced lunch, so they're already duplicated in the count. Um, Mrs. Ford will talk about what the formulas are. But I think for the board, there's, there's some very key <coughs> concepts in terms of your operations over the forever till it changes again, which in some ways we hope it doesn't because it will allow you and also require you to go to the public, which we'll be talking about, get a lot of input, and really make a difference from a local decision-making standpoint in the education of children who need extra <coughs> services and not have to do it necessarily based on state guidelines. Now, again, I wanna underscore that sometimes we're gonna come to you and say it's required by federal law and those are, do not change in any way under the LCFF. So it was adopted in 2000, June 30th, 2014. It was a major, major program um, pushed forward by the governor and the legislature. And I want, there are eight state priorities that are identified. I want to underscore one other thing for you, though, and that's that the total funding that you will get the next year and this year for the weighted student formulas under the LCFF will still be less than what you got in 2007 8 for the categoricals that were exist in existence at that time and the base revenue limit at that time. So even though you're going to hear things about ratcheting up to target areas and new funding, there there isn't new funding. We're not even reaching the old funding. And a um, couple other things, you've, and you've already, I think, experienced this. Some districts are getting different proportions of funding, and I think you all heard about some of them where they're not getting very much money because they don't have English language learners and they don't have kids from poverty backgrounds. And I, I guess, not I guess, my answer to that, from a district that has a large number of English language learners and a lot of children from poverty, we know that the, the children in these categories and foster youth are every bit as capable of learning the things that we teach as any other students, but they may, may need other resources. Obviously, if you were to all, if all of us were gonna go in, to enroll in the Sorbonne in France, and start taking um, freshman level classes. Well, I, some of you may teach French, but we would need extra classes from French, French students so that we could speak with them. And I'd liken that to the same as our students who are, not Engli who are English language learners. So over the next really several years, we will be looking at a combination of programs that are tried and true. There's a lot of things we do in this district that have been and will continue to be and, and I hope that we will continue things like interventions, our intervention classes, our double block classes, our staff development programs, our, our coaching that we do for teachers. Um, a lot of the curriculum is already designed for English language learners and supplementary, supplementary materials. Um, there have not been really materials necessarily designed for kids from poverty, although many of our Teachers have gone through training that specifically deals with teaching students who are, come from backgrounds that are poor. So, what was published? Read out. I want to trust you. Thank you. <laughs> so, over the years, we will be getting public input, input from our teachers, and from stakeholders in Harupa Unified School District 
and putting that together with what we see both with ourselves and other districts to be tried and true, research proven strategies for students and we'll have a lot more flexibility than we've had in the past. It would be nice if we had more money too, but I want to remember that is for, it's not probably, and it's all set on targets that end in 2021. It's not so really the last couple of years that we even get back to the 2007-8 funding level. So I think that um, I actually am probably at the end of my slide and ready to turn it over to Mrs. Ford unless there's any general questions. You can go ahead with that. Good evening. Park Peninsula. Mm -hmm. uh, so LCFF or the local control funding formula. Uh, this is a change in our funding or budgeting. Uh, we haven't had a change like this for over 40 years. So it is a big change. And we are still going through that process of changing. So I want to make everybody aware of that. Um, they're still changing our county system. That hasn't changed over as of yet. And we're still in the, the process of changing what our budgets look like, you know, to account for um, LCFF funding. Okay. Um, and the state is shifting away, as, as Mr. Chairman mentioned, the state is shifting away from categorical funds as far as from the state level. We will continue to get our federal categorical programs and all of those requirements will still be there. Right. And as Mr. Dabrowski is going to talk about in a few minutes, part of the LCFF is ensuring that you have provided opportunities for stakeholders to have input into your uh, not only your local control funding formula, but also into your um, local control accountability plan, your LCAP. So looking at the differences or the comparison between how we were funded before and how we will receive funding now, before LCFF, we were funded under revenue limit. So we received a certain amount of money per student no matter if they were a kindergartner or if they were a 12th grader. And then based on that, that's how we identified how much revenue was coming into the district. After LCFF, there's base funding by different grade levels or grade spans. So K3 is one grade span, 4, 6 is another, 7, 8 is another, and 9, 12 is yet another. And depending on what grade is how much funding would be provided to, for each one of those students. Before LCFF, state categorical programs also had temporary flexibility. So there were state categoricals, but because of the budget crisis, we were able to flex those funds, which we did, to the tune of between 5.3 and 5.7 million dollars, into our unrestricted general fund. That goes away under LCFF. There's no more ability to flex because all of the funds are all together now. <clears throat> so after LCFF, we have un, what we call an unduplicated pupil formula where based on our English learners, a student that is either an English learner or free and reduced lunch student, a low income student, or a foster youth, you would be allocated so much funding for each of those pupils, but only once. So they can only be counted once. That's where the unduplicated count comes in. And then before LCSF, the K-3 class size reduction, um, limited funding with unlimited class sizes. So your class sizes were based on what was, what was negotiated in your contract for K-3. And we have flexibility on the K-3 funding to be, so if you were not at a 20 to 1 ratio in your classroom, you could still receive funding. You might be paying a, a penalty, but you would still receive some funding. So there was some flexibility with that. That especially came into play with the budget crisis. Now with K-3 class size reduction under, um, after LCFF, 
you have to make progress towards the 24 to 1 in your K through third grade classrooms unless or or um, if you have a collective bargaining agreement that identifies a different uh, ratio. And in our case for this year, we do have a collective bargaining agreement that does identify a different ratio. It's a 32 to 1 ratio at our K to 3. Make sure I said that right there. And then before LCFF, um, it was all about accountability. Um, or accountability and performance was separate from funding and budgeting. And with LCFF or after LCFF, the funding and budgeting have to align to your local control accountability plan. So all of those two elements, how you spend your funding and what you have in your plan, need to make sure that they align. What's unchanged, when we mentioned some of this, is um, we will continue to have financial audits. We will continue to be required uh, to meet all of the federal guidelines uh, for, their, for the funding, planning, and the accountability. We also will be required to meet all of the Williams compliance items. And we will also uh, be required to, uh, to make sure that we still maintain our SARC reports for each of our schools. So as I mentioned, the base grant and how the funding is appropriated under LCFF, the base grant of the post student by grade span is on the grade span is listed there, the K3, 4, 6, 7, 8, and 9, 12. And in K3, there is an additional $723 <coughs> that is provided for your class size reduction. That's per student. And then under 912, there's an additional $219 that's provided for your um, CTE or your career tech um, funding per student. The supplemental grant is based on the number of en English learners, of low income, and foster students. And again, they can only be counted in one category. So right now, when we look at our unduplicated numbers, we have about 930, might be off a little bit of numbers, 930 or so English learners that are not on free and reduced lunch. And all of our foster youth are on free and reduced. The concentration grant for the districts are, are, is only available to districts that have a 55% or more of their enrollment is on free and reduced lunch. And that would be the case for us. So we do qualify as a district for the concentration grant. Other funds that are outside of LCFF are your special education funds, your CLIA, your um, agricultural vocational education funds, any of your specialized secondary programs, all of the state assessments, and the after school program, such as in our case, it's staying together. So those all are outside of LCFF funding. So for my idea of how this looks, um, this is an LCFF entitlement example. So this is not us. This is not a group of, this is an example. Okay. A district's LCF entitlement for 2013-14 uh, is based on its 2012-13 base year funding level. So they use the 2012-13 year as the base year for the funding. And then they compare that to the target. So if we look at, um, I have three scenarios here. I have a low English learner and LI's low income student district. And then in the next column, I have a medium English learner, low income district, and then a high English learner, low income student district. So if we look at those, and you can see that between um, the target, the LCFF target, and that target is for 2020-21, a, a district with low numbers of English learners and low income students would receive $8,000 per student at the 
to 2021. But they start with a base in 2012-13 of 5,200. So the difference between the two is 2,800. And this current year, 1314, the state is funding a gap, the gap between those, between the 5,200 and the $8,000 target, they're funding the gap at 11.78%. So that would be 11.78% of the difference, the 2,800, or $329. So per pupil, for this low district, you would get 5,200, plus $329. That would be for each student. So that just gives you an idea of how that. So in our, yes, sir. But don't multiply this times the number of students we have. Because first, they haven't told us that they're really gonna do that. And second of all, the computation is, they do it in a different way. Instead of going by per pupil, they multiply all of the pupils, multiply the factors, and then they back the per pupil out. So we didn't even have a clue what those numbers are yet, so this was the only way we could kind of give you the concept. But you're not gonna get a precise number by doing, if you say, okay, so we have 19,500 students and X number in each grade level. It's this, somehow, this will surprise you, but the legislature figured out the most complicated way of getting to that formula that they possibly could. We have three different calculators that are out there right now that they've asked us to use, and all three result in different numbers. So that's what we're kind of running into. Uh, you know, we don't want to give we, we don't want to give numbers that are not accurate. So that's why I'm giving you just an example. And uh, so the fifty-two hundred dollars is not us. Okay, um, the $8,000 target is not us. The $9,100 target isn't, and neither, neither is the 11300 11, These are just examples to use. What I can tell you is that we fall, as far as our unduplicated, or as far as our number of free and reduced lunch and our English learners, we fall between the medium and high in our numbers and in our percentages. So that's where we will end up once we know what the calculations will look like with LCFF. Mm -hmm. What is our current base? Our current base is um, 52, in 1213 it was 5268. Okay. So these, these are, it's going to be close to when we run the calculator, when we run the calculator, we've been everywhere between the medium, the 9100 as our target, to around a little over 10,000 as as our high. So it's it's a range between the two, which of course then changes you know your percentage of the difference and the gap that's being funded. So that's why I don't want to give you exact numbers because. We'll and, and the base applies differently to each of the four grade level spans also. So right. that, that's why it's hard. There's not, you can't say we're getting 5,200 times the number of students. You've got to go X times your K through three students, X times your four through six students. And then you have to add your K through class size reduction funding, grade span funding on it, and you have to add your CTE funding onto that base uh, of the 912, and then on top of that, you have to add your supplemental and concentration based on only your unduplicated students. And for concentration, only those students that are above the 55%. So they made it very clear. <laughs> um, you just mentioned that the base funding for this current year, 2013-14, uh, is uh, $5,268, correct? I'm sorry, Senator. The, the base funding for this current um, school year is uh, $5,268. That was for 12-13. Oh, for 12-13, okay. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah, it was 5268 which is everything that they're basing our calculations on <laughs> comes from the 12-13 school year. And our current uh, allocation effort this year? That's what we still have yet to determine. 
So we have, so even though Bob Kirkin passed a while back and they have our money, we still haven't seen a penny and will not for a while, well, or how have, does that work? We have funding coming in, but the funding is coming in just like it did last year. Oh. That's so why the base is higher than it, it was, like $500, I think, pupil lower before mm -hmm. Prop 30. So with that Prop 30, it, Prop 30 is built into that base. The trouble with is you can apply it to last year and we built kind of the, un the question you didn't ask was how did we build this year's right, budget? I, yeah. Is we basically <clears throat> took that base just with coal, I believe, and didn't do anything else and we're very conservative about it. Right, we just got into coal. Right, so because again, we, you know, we don't know what, there's nothing flexed because there's no categoricals and we don't know really how they're going to come back and apply the grade spans and everything else. So we, they say they'll tell us probably in April. <laughs> but Just in time. Yeah, well, we'll, yeah. We'll, yeah. And that's one of the reasons, and they are, again, they're getting all of this worked out right now, and that's one of the reasons why they've already told us that in May they'll do what they call a true up, <clears> so <throat> that you know whatever funding then is due to us based on our unduplicated account, the unduplicated count of students, they will then provide us um, with that funding in May or June, but they'll let us know what that would be in May. So I, I guess I'm, st <clears throat> I'm still a little confused then. Um, so our current budget is essentially um, based on the same is allocation that we received in 12-13? It's essentially last year's budget, 12-13, right. with COLA. With COLA. Mm -hmm. But without the categoricals. Well, actually, the categoricals came in the same way as well. Okay. <laughs> and, and, they, and they chew up. And I, and I want to say something. Even though this is, there's a lot of details that are not worked out, this is really good for districts. And f it's really good for kids. It sends the money to where the kids are and where it's needed. So it will take, I think, the legislature and probably some cleanup language in, in a couple years to really get a hold of what it means and get it moving. But it's much better than the old base revenue limit, which was equally unfair, where we had districts, like four districts in this county were getting $400 per student more than we are for no reason other than that was their, how their taxes were built into it. Someday we'll know how much money we get. Maybe. Soon. Soon. Okay, so <coughs> looking at this in a different way. If we look at, um, next slide, in our growth. So in 2013-14, we're making growth towards the 2020-21 target. So in this example, it was the same the same uh, figures that we just used in the last table. But in this example, it just graphically shows you that what is being funded is in red, that gap. So between the, the excuse me, what's being funded is in red, the gap is in green. So for the high district, the high EL and low income district, if the base in 1213 of the funding was 5,200, and their target when, when they get to 2020-21 is 11,300 per student, and that's average because again, each grade span will have a different actual number per student. But if it's 11,300, then the first year in 13-14, the portion of the gap that will be funded is $718. Sure. Uh, this LCFF target, 8,9113, that is accurate. That is accurate. That's. Is that <coughs> this is this is a, a, just a fictitious district that's out there. Okay, so and there is no. I mean, we don't know what our target will be. We we when we run the calculators, we've been anywhere between. Um, a little over $9,000 on an average per student to a little over $10,000 on an average per student. But that's a very large difference. So if you're 
ask you if you have an absolute accurate number. The answer is no. We have none at this point. Okay. Is the state factor what what they're going to uh, <clears throat> pay for the difference? Is, is, is that number in stone? The eleven point seven eight is for this year. For this year. Yes. Do we know how much is going to increase in subsequent years? We've seen a range between twelve percent and and sixteen. So that by twenty what twenty twenty one, that mm -hmm. it'll be max the max. Right. Max. Right. So each and what that eleven point seven eight percent is tied to is basically the economy and how well the economy does. But that's, that's, that doesn't sound good. <laughs> <laughs> so that, that's a critical point because in twenty twenty one that target may or may not be reached. If the economy is great and there's a certain amount, this isn't necessarily good, there's a certain amount of inflation or state taxes grow, then we may be above the target. If there's another recession, we might not be anywhere near the target. This, this assumes a growth in the economy based on current projections, which are pretty robust. And and isn't that also about the time that um, Prop 30 funding would? Four years from now, right? Yeah, three, three well, we have a portion that uh, Yeah, falls and there's off. a portion that's seven years. Three and s four and seven, so three and six, three right? And six. Right. Yes, yeah, so we have, so that factor will be factored that factor in. Well. Basically, about two years after we get funded, we'll tell you how much we had. <laughs> <laughs> I won't sell the farm. <laughs> so just going through how they calculate the supplement compliance and the uh, concentration limit is that, uh, again, it's based on an unduplicated count of English learners. And just so you know where that number comes from, that will, we actually have to submit for the first time this year through CalPads. And through our CalPads, Cal CalPads submissions, we'll be submitting those unduplicated numbers for English learners for the reduced lunch and cost review. And that has not been certified yet, which also tells you why they can't give us the funding yet, because they don't have our duplicated numbers until those are certified through CalPads. So, um, and concentration is based on, on the uh, local new back to supplemental. Supplemental, it's they calculate it as 20% of the base funding. So again, each, each base is different based on the, the grade span. So K3 base will be different from a 4.6, from a 7.8, and from a 9.12. And then it would be 20% of each of those different base, depending on which unduplicated student that is, which so unduplicated count. So it gets very compl complicated because you might have so many of your unduplicated students that are in K3, and another number that's in your 4-6, and another number in your 7-8, and so each of those will generate different levels of funding. And then concentration is 50% uh, of the base grant. And so again, that's the unduplicated count of English learners, low-income, and students um, in foster care or foster youth. So if we look at our unduplicated numbers right now of students that we have either in free and reduced lunch, uh, free and reduced lunch program, the, the, an English learner, or foster youth, we have 15,696 students that meet that criteria. How many? 15,696. Out of 18,000 something? Uh, we also include in here, we, kind of going back to another piece of this. With this funding, we also include all of our county students as well. Oh, okay. okay. Whereas we didn't, before we actually didn't, because that funding went directly to the county, and then the county took that out before they ever, uh, before they ever sent it to us to be received. Now it's gonna work differently. We'll actually be funded for those students and then we'll have to pay the county. Mm -hmm. So um, we actually have about 19, a little over 19,000. So I, that's my section of the presentation, which I'm sure is very clear, and you know exactly how much money we're getting. Uh, now I get to turn it over to Dave, so he can be a lot clearer. Before
before you leave though, Paula, mm -hmm. this 15,000 students, those are the ones that we have presently, but I think we've talked that there's siblings of students, say in the elementary school, that are getting the free and reduced lunch, but as the kids get older, they tend to not apply because they're not gonna eat in the cafeteria for whatever reason. So we can still get them to do the application just because they qualify for it doesn't mean they need to use it, but it'll give us more funding, correct? Right. Right. And we're looking at those reports so we can identify that exact situation and also identify our kindergartners that may not be um, taking advantage of the free and reduced lunch as well. Thank you. All right. So glad I'm not in business services. <laughs> um, so we're going to talk about the local control accountability plan next. With this grand change in funding came a new, um, a new plan, a new way of accountability for what to do with these funds and how the state's going to monitor what's being done with these funds. So the new plan is called the LCAP. Local Control Accountability Plan, and it needs to be adopted by the board no later than June 30th of this upcoming year. Um, they will be providing us with a template for the elements and how the elements fit together in the plan. They, they have not done that as of yet. Um, they tell us it should be out in January, so we're, we're beginning to work, but we're waiting for that template to give us a clear picture of what they want this to look at. Um, it will have eight categories that we're gonna talk about in a minute. <laughs> I'm still grappling with this idea of um, building a spending plan, which this is basically asking us to do when we don't know the money that we're going to be needing to support that plan. Uh, if I'm going to build a home and I have these grandiose ideas for something that I really wanna have, but I'm not sure if I'm gonna get the funding from the bank for it. Uh, who's gonna be left holding the bag? <laughs> no, just just wondering how's that gonna really play out because uh, it's uh, uh, it, the way sort of I understand it is that you're to use you're, you're to target your monies in a strategic fashion to ensure the maximum opportunities for students to learn and student achievement and success. But in order to do that, you really need to know the resources you have at your disposal to begin to determine we need to put so much money here, so many funds, so many funds here, or am I yeah, missing that, something? That would be very helpful if we had that. Oh, okay, well, so, so as you go through this, go ahead and enlighten me as to how well, we're going to Well, let me just done. say, give an example. So one of the things we know that has worked for kids in this district has been um, doing intervention classes. And so we're going to look at how appropriate those are as we continue. And we're gonna, as we talk and work with like the local, as Dave goes through about the, how the plans are formulated, let's say intervention classes stay in there. Well, we're not gonna say intervention classes, there's now gonna be, instead of 21, there's gonna be 43 intervention classes. We're gonna say that's gonna be a major strategy. And as we're funded for it, we'll use it. And, and one of the things I think that that you in particular will, will see, Mr. Mendez, that's different, is in the old categorical days, school sites were pretty much required to buy stuff out of like Title I funds. You had to say, okay, to address the Title I kids, we're gonna <laughs> buy accelerated reader, or we're gonna buy this, or we're gonna buy that. So our strategies are going to be, while they're directed to improving the achievement of the kids that are targeted, they may be more general in nature and they may grow out of school sites in particular. So we're gonna kind of be a little bit behind the curve in funding and ahead of the curve in planning, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. So we'll, we'll be conservative. Mm -hmm. and, and I don't think you hit this, but one of the provisions, the, the key provisions that the state board is looking at in developing the regulations is that districts should spend more provide more or achieve more for the children that are targeted. So if we look at English language learners, are we doing one of those three things? Now for us, we're, our primary focus in the end is that they achieve more, I mean, really. So we're gonna look at those strategies and then apply them 
And hopefully by the time we get into the second or third year, we're gonna have a more concrete idea of the funding that we have, hopefully. But Mr. Dabrowski's job is still gonna be to go out and develop this plan that's in some ways conceptual, but tied to funding in terms of what are the concrete things we're going to buy if we have the money. Yes. So this, this plan will have a template uh, sometime in the near future. We're hoping January. And we'll have more information about what the plan needs to look like. We do know that the plan calls for, or the, the legislation calls for, greater um, collaboration with all of our stakeholders, with, with our parents, with our, our associations, uh, with the public in general. So we know that, and we know that it, it asks for things like plain language. They want it to be sort of a readable, digestible document, um, which, which for all of you, having read through our LEAP plans and school site plans, you know, that's, that's a divergence from past as well. Um, and back in the day, when we had all of these categorical programs, the state would provide us with this fund with a very narrow purpose and say, this, this amount of money is for this program. And they monitored that by verifying that everything we spent fell within that category of expenditure. So it was really based around what did you do with the money and did it fit the category that the money was intended for? That was their manner of monitoring. But now that it's a larger, more flexible pot of money, the, the, um, the accountability is gonna be about performance. Like Mr. Deshaun mentioned, spend more, um, produce, produce more, you know, achieve more. So it's really going to be on, on us to make sure that our plan is solid and that we're meeting the goals that we set for our students and that we're using those, those funds in quality ways with quality programs to ensure that our students are achieving. Um, so like I said, and student needs should drive those spending decisions and we're expected to meet the various state priorities. We'll talk about those eight categories of the plan too. So as our district develops its budget, it goes hand in hand with the plan because the, the plan should drive the budget and drive the expenditures. And, and it says parent and community input and transparent information available to communicate how funding addresses the student needs. Now in, in our district, our plan at this point is to go out to all of our school start sites beginning in January and present information at an open meeting at each school about <laughs> common core standards and achievement and the funding formula and the accountability so that our parents are informed and can provide us feedback about what they would like to see. We've, um, and we've, done, we've done similar type things. We've presented to the, to the DAC, to the District Gate Advisory, to the DLAT, um, but we think to get really the most number of parents have access to this information to participate in the process, we need to do it at their school because we believe they'll come to the school to listen to the information we can provide and participate in the discussion. So that, um, at an upcoming board meeting, you'll hear about dates and how that will work, but those presentations will be done by myself, um, primarily me, and also Mr. Trujillo and Mrs. Porter at some of the schools. State at times is heavy handed in the requirements. So they're going to back off on that, but they still will want to see the performance. Okay. Absolutely. Is that where we're going? And that's the shift. Is they, you know, they're going to give you some leeway in how you spend the funds, but they want to see those funds work. So the plan is designed to be a three year plan. And so it'll be, it'll be adopted by the end of June, and then um, it will describe the annual goals which would be based on these eight categories. It will address numerically significant subgroups of students. And, and that used to be a much larger number. Now it would be a smaller number. 30 students in any given subgroup, um, with the exception of foster youth, which we 
which is as small as 15 students, now becomes a numerically significant subgroup. So goals will need to be written for the various populations of, of, group, of students that we have. And the, the plans that we already have, the school plans, the local educational agency meet plan, um, those address in the past both state and federal programs. So the federal requirements have not gone away. So those plans will still need to be maintained and updated and revised because they will address things like our Title I funding, our Title II, our Title III, because those federal categorical programs will still come to us in the same manner that they always have. So we'll kind of be in a little bit of both worlds, where we're still um, at the federal level maintaining the same kind of accountability that we've already had, but at the state level, it will be a, a little bit of a different model. And, and additionally, as that LCAP is developed, then the school plans will also be revised to meet those, those priorities and things that are developed while still recognizing that they'll need to meet the needs of the federal programs as well. In this slide, we just, I just talked about, um, you know, that, that the funding is generated by those groups of students that we talked about, our students who are low income and English learner and foster. And so those um, supplemental and concentration funds are intended to be used to improve their achievement. So we will need to show how we're going to do that um, in the plan. Now these are the eight priority areas that our plan will be built around. And you can take a look at those. I'll go into each one in just a little bit of detail so you have a sense of what they are. First we have, if you go to the next slide, student achievement. Um, which could be a variety of things, performance on standardized tests, API, students being college and career ready, it could be um, whether they're A through G eligible by the time they graduate, we will have some, you know, we're, we're in a changing landscape, but we'll have some ability to make some choices about how we demonstrate student achievement. Course of study, meaning that our students have access to all the courses of study that they need to be successful and to graduate college and career ready when they exit our system. Student engagement, meaning are our students, are they coming to school, are they graduating, are they dropping out, how, you know, what do those numbers look like? Um, like I said, other student outcomes, that's where we make some decisions and determinations about what's important for a group of students and how we're going to demonstrate that they're meeting those outcomes. Their school climate, which is suspension rates, expulsion rates, um, and other things that we may come up with, but talking about how students are successfully remaining in school and, and meeting those, those standards. Parent involvement, how we promote effective parent involvement. Basic services, meaning do we have, uh, like the Williams type things, do we have access, do our students have access to standards online material? Are the teachers who are teaching the classes credentialed and authorized to be in those classes? and those type of things are the facilities and good repair. And then the last one, my favorite, Common Core. And that's that we're successfully implementing Common Core standards for all of our subgroups, including our English learners. So in terms of the process, as we move down the road, you can see like step number one is consultation with teachers, principals, school personnel, students, local bargaining units, talking about priorities. And, and we've actually, we're including parents in this step number one as well, because we feel like it's, it's gonna need to be all along the way. Step number two, as we then have a draft of the plan available, we're gonna present that for review and comment to advisory committees, um, English learner advisory committees, and in, in the law it mentions that the student superintendent must respond in writing to comments that are received. And then step three, as more of the board level, we have public input, uh, an, an official public opportunity to submit written comments regarding the plan, and a public hearing where the superintendent will, again, respond in writing to comments received. And then, lastly, the, the board adopts the plan. It's adopted with the budget, because the two need to go hand in hand. 
um, submit it to the county office, and, um, and then the county office will post that for each district. And you can kind of see the little graphic about the timeline. And in, in January, we hope to have that template. We're beginning to work now, scheduling the parent meetings, developing our priorities, looking at the programs, as Mr. Deshaun mentioned, that have already been effective for us, um, and then aligning the goals of the plan with the spending goals of the budget as well. It's, it's kind of a nice, convergence of different things. We have, and going back to Common Core, we have a new set of standards. We have a new ability to involve teachers in the process and develop effective curriculum to really um, uh, ensure success for our students. And then at the same time now, we have this, although it's, it's very gray at the moment, we have this new opportunity to really um, target and, and make local decisions about what's best for our students from a program and a funding standpoint as well. So, you know, it's, it's, um, it's a huge change and there are a lot of people at the CDE right now hustling to try and catch up and a lot of things we don't know yet and we sort of need to know before we can get too much further down the road. Um, but at the same time, it's, it's a really great opportunity for our kids. Uh, okay. um, since when we put the plan in place, and your goal is uh, achievement, say, that's the achievement. We have to be accountable to that. Um, and I've been reading, I know in other parts of the country, they came full force with the Common Core, and they instituted it too quickly, they didn't have enough staff training, um, and they failed in the first couple of years in, in meeting the goal. So in thinking of that, is there a way that we can monitor whatever goal it is, say it's achieve achievement, in small markers, so that we could be ahead if we think that our students in certain level of grades are not making the, making the progress? Because it would be a huge disaster to go for a couple of years and find out we're not getting anywhere. So in order to ensure that we achieve what you go for, we need to be really careful and put the money where it's needed in, in, in order to make the goals happen. Absolutely, and, and it, it's interesting that you said that because in our, in our second meeting today, when we talk about the Common Core update, we're gonna talk about the units of study committee, the groups of teachers that are developing the curriculum for us to implement next year in language arts and math, and we're gonna talk about the assessments that they're creating, and so if you have say eight units throughout a school year, there will be assessments for each of those units so that, so that we can monitor student progress all along the way. So I think in the, answer, the answer to your question um, is, is absolutely. We, we wanna have well-developed curriculum using our experts, our teachers in that development, as well as monitoring all of them and make sure our kids are being successful. Yeah, if you get too ambitious, I'm sorry. If you, if you make your mark too high, then you set yourself up for failure because, because there hasn't been any um, trials or there hasn't been anything that, that tells us that this is actually going to work good. We don't have that experience with it. Um, we can only go by what we're hearing. And, and not all of it's good. And, and you know, I think uh, not, even, not even as most of what we're hearing even true. And, and people get on the wrong track. So I think we need to make sure that what's important is that how our kids are learning in the classroom, just focus on that and, and make sure that we're meeting reasonable goals. And just and I think that's why I wanna just interject one thing because this may get lost. One of the things, at least as it sits now in the law, we can use local benchmarks and local standards for what we want it. We, we can't give up the state we can't give up the federal, but we could say, for example, we could look at our own test of standards or whatever we want to call it and say, we think that's a very critical measure. So we want to look at it for each of the subgroups and we're going to give in our LCAP as much weight on that as we do on something else. We could look at college going rates. 
we could say we're going to analyze year on year by student, not by whole group. So mm -hmm. there's, we're going to have a lot of opportunity to have local accountability measures to, and also what we would do if we don't meet those measures. So, you know, hopefully it stays that way. I think there's going to be a temptation for the state legislature to come back and tighten those things up and make them more restricted. The state also is revamping the Public School Accountability Act, so the whole API is going to change in the next several years. Now, the AYP, who knows what's going to happen with that in the federal. We couldn't even guess. But I think your point is, is, is very well taken and that we need to look carefully at what local measures we think are important for our children. And I think it's, it's a real benefit to us to have the experience of 45 states who are all going about this in their own unique way. And, and in Harupa, we have some flexibility in terms of how do we get there to Common Core. Even though the standards may be the same across the country, the, the way in which districts make that transition is up to the districts. And we're drawing on the hundreds of years of experience and the, and the classroom experts that we have and working hand in hand with them as they develop the best way to teach the standards that we have. And I, and I think it's, it's that's absolutely the best That's it, yeah, that's exactly it. Thank you very much. And we will adjourn this special meeting and give you a couple of quick seconds if you need to go grab something before we start closed session meeting. <laughs>